All right. Let's see if we can. Waiting for everyone to get on here. <laughs> Trying to figure out how I can move my. There we go. I'm setting up my screen, everyone. Just be patient with me just a moment. I don't know if anybody's on here yet or not, but. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see what I've got here. <laughs> is anyone on yet? I see, my wife is on. Um, uh, still waiting on folks to get on. Um, anyway, this is Brother Smith. Little Rock, Arkansas, First Gospel Church, and um, broadcasting our live Bible study tonight. And um, I want to, I know that right now that um, it seems like there is quite a uh, increase uh, in this coronavirus Ep uh, epidemic right now and so I want to encourage everyone um, to be careful you know try to wear your mask be careful to space don't be getting around a lot of people that you don't know especially without a mask and without spacing and for those in our church here locally um, I feel like that the way we're handling our uh, breakfast on Sunday mornings, our continental breakfast, is adequate. Um, but I will ask everyone that please only families who have been together sit together and do not be sitting with people that you're not haven't been around, uh, especially in the dining room where we, you know, don't have a mask on. And then upstairs, I'm going to encourage everyone, uh, please, to wear a mask anytime you're moving around in the church. And our church is large enough that we can easily have adequate spacing, especially since our crowds are down somewhat with, with the coronavirus uh, in, uh, going on at this time. And so families that have been together, can sit on the same pew together. Please space at least, leave at least a pew between each of you, if not two pews. Uh, we're not going to require people to wear a mask while singing if they're spaced properly. And so uh, please everyone, uh, you know, try to be diligent to wear your mask when moving around and space properly and don't sit together with people that you haven't been with. Uh, and that just basically means family members can sit together. Anyway, God bless your hearts. It's good to be here again this evening. I, I want to say something tonight a little bit about, um, I want to cover the scriptures in the book of Revelations that talks about the beast and his image. 
Uh, and the reason I want to bring up these scriptures is because the image of the beast has never been set up yet. And that, you know, is going to take place um, when the two horn beast in the 13th chapter of book of Revelations makes an image to the beast. Now, um, if you if you go to the very beginning of the chapter of chapter 13, let me let me just rehearse that with you just a little bit. Um, you know, I, I talked to several saints and I see that there's still some confusion about, you know, when all of these things are going to take place. Like, for you know, for an example, uh, when's the bride going to be made up? When is the, uh, this, the image of the beast going to be set up? When is, um, you know, I had somebody talk to me this, this week about Jesus coming. When is Jesus coming? I want to say something about that, <laughs> the coming of the Lord. Um, um, and and when are the, you know, when are the 10 kings, uh, come, when do they come into existence? So there are several things that seems to be somewhat confusing to several. And, uh, you know, so that's why I put on this page that you can text me with any questions that you may have, and I I will do it. I'll be diligent to try to answer all questions that are text to me. And remember this: there's no such thing as a dumb question. You know, if we don't if we don't know the answer, and let me tell you something: even ministers, not every minister. You know, there's many ministers in the body of Christ that have. Uh, you know, in other words, they have different ministers have gifts, different gifts, gifts differing from each other. And that's important because we need a good rounded ministry that and no minister is able to handle every thing in the Bible. You know, it's just it's just too vast. It's too great. And so there's ministers that has, you know, God's called them for and give them a gift for in certain areas. And uh, and God deals with them in those areas, and and they can help us by sharing with us the things that God has revealed to them and given them, in in within their gift. And so, um, I enjoy hearing the other ministers in the body of Christ and what's their gifts their gifts were. And so, uh, there's nothing wrong with you know, I mean, with with men dealing in certain areas that may be different from other men in other areas, we can learn from one another, and we certainly need that. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've been mentioning here of late, uh, I've been talking about fellowship, trust, confidence. I should say confidence and then trust unity and love and <clears throat> until we have proper fellowship and i'm talking about godly fellowship um you know you can be in fellowship somebody said you <laughs> someone said you can tie two cats tails together and hang them over a over a clothesline and they'll have fellowship but that's not the kind of fellowship that I'm talking about. You can have fellowship that's not good fellowship, but it's not godly. But I'm talking about godly fellowship where we're endeavoring uh, to, to resist the uh, works of the flesh and endeavoring to uh, work and be led of the spirit and, um, have fellowship in the spirit, you know, the night, is it in the, the ninth chapter of the book of Proverbs, it says wisdom has builded her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. I say that is God and Christ and his fivefold ministry. That's what holds the kingdom together. That's the pillars 
and then um, she's uh, she's killed her beast. She's mingled her wine, furnished her table. Well, in mingling her wine, that's us having fellowship with one another and having fellowship with Jesus Christ and the Father. And in mingling our wine, or our spirits, mingling our spirits together, keeping the right spirit, uh, talking about the, the, the spirit of Christ, us having fellowship with Christ on an ongoing basis to where our relationship with him is increased to a point that we get to know him better. I want to know him as I am known of him. Uh, I would like to get as close to the Lord as I can because I want to be able to trust him. And the reason I brought up trust and confidence is because uh, I think the Lord is the, the only one you can have absolute trust in right now. I do believe that there are men that, and and saints alike that can grow to the place that they can be trusted. Paul said, uh, follow me as I follow Christ. And so there's our measuring stick. There's our guide is that as long as we feel and see someone dedicated and spiritually following the Lord, that we can follow them and we can they can be a uh, an example to us and a leader to us uh, once if we see that they're 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 not following God then our confidence will wane uh, but you can have complete confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Father right now and you know I, I would say we we should have confidence in the ministry. And the more the ministry is in fellowship and mingle our wine or our spirits come together, I think that uh, we, can, we can get in a greater place of trust. And that trust will produce unity. Remember the 133rd Psalm tells us that unity is, it's like the, oil that ran down on the beard, even Aaron's beard. And that was, uh, that's what produced life forevermore. It, it ran down on the skirts of his garment. And there's where life is produced forevermore out of unity. And that has to be a godly unity. So I'm talking about godly fellowship a godly trust, a godly confidence, a godly unity, and that eventually produces the love of God. And so uh, I'm asking the Lord to let me have a greater fellowship with him. I'd like to get in unity with him. Wouldn't you like to be where Jesus declared to his disciples when he said, he prayed for them in the 17th chapter of St. John said, make them one, Father, even as you and I are one. Dear Lord, that is that is unity. And we should strive for that. It's available. And uh, God wants us to get in that place together with him. We are living in a very divided time in this world. This world is very divided. The United States of America is the greatest nation upon the face of the earth, and it is more divided, I believe, than it ever has been. This nation is in almost utter chaos. Our government's in chaos. Uh, there's, there's tremendous upheaval and unrest in our country, not even to mention the world, the world's in trouble too. But the United States of America is the country that God called to restore his church in. 
This is where God called Brother Souders and began to give the revelation of a restored church. And uh, God's been working on that now for over a hundred years, uh, well over a hundred years here in America. And so uh, this nation, God called for that purpose and God will accomplish what he called this nation to do, but um, it doesn't mean that the nation uh, will remain and it hasn't remained a godly nation. This nation has turned its back on God uh, and, uh, and fell in a great measure from the things that God established with our forefathers when he brought them to, uh, to Plymouth Rock in the beginning of, of our nation, its founding. And so, but I, I feel like it is part of prophecy. God knew this nation would, would, uh, would not accomplish moving forward as a godly nation um, for only a period of time. And I feel like there is going to be a lot of pressure on the church in the future uh, we're, we're undergoing change right now and we'll continue to over, to undergo change. And so, uh, the, you know, this pandemic, I think they will get control of it. It will, we will get past it. We've already lost some really good people in the body of Christ, but saints, there's been over a million people, uh, die with this, with this virus. And uh, just very few. It's just a trickling number, even though one is is enormous to us to lose a soul, lose a saint. We didn't lose the soul. Uh, you know, you hadn't lost anything that you don't know where it is. And and a saint of God, we know where saints of God's are, and uh, we know that. Uh, we're all striving for the bride of Christ and, and uh, those who have not yet made the bride of Christ are waiting on resurrections. If they lived a just life or even an unjust life, they will come up in a resurrection. And so uh, we haven't lost them. We've just uh, been separated from them for a time, but we will see them again. Um, anyway, uh, concerning the coming of the Lord. Let me say something about that. Jesus said that the coming of the Lord would be as the lightning is from the east to the west. Um, and that word lightning is talking about illuminating. It's an illuminating uh, light. And it's talking about understanding. It's not talking about a bolt of lightning uh, that's how I used to look at it when I was in Babylon many, many years ago. And, you know, like a bolt of lightning strike in the sky, and that's how the Lord was going to come, just like that. Well, that's not the way the Lord comes. Uh, the coming of the Lord uh, uh, is uh, the... Uh, it's like it came, like the Lord came in the early church. See, many th people think here Jesus is just coming. Well, uh, you may be talking about Jesus coming for his bride to make up his bride, uh, a coming for bride members to finish making up his bride in the end of the Gentile world. But the coming of the Lord, if you look at how he came in the early church, he came on the day of Pentecost. Of course, we know he came as a uh, as a baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes. As, but it, he grew up and overcame the flesh, and the flesh. He was tried and tempted. Jesus never had a fallen nature like we have. He was like the second Adam. He came to this world, he was born of God, and he, he, he wasn't born of Adam. He was born of God, and he didn't have a fallen nature, but he was. Um, he came 
through mother uh, through his mother's womb, Mary, and became a human. He came he came all the way down and became like one of us. Read it in Hebrews the second, third, and fourth chapter. Um, he he it behooved him to become like his brother, that he might become a, a faithful high priest. Uh, Jesus had to experience. Uh, what's in a human? What what is you know the fact that he could be tested? Paul said in Hebrews he was tested in all points as we are. Well, he was tried, he was tested, that but he never gave in to the try, the trials, or the test. He never sinned to sin. He finished what Adam failed to do, and uh, and he he did that for you and I, and he came here that we could be reconciled to God through a new birth, a new creature, a new creation. And that's through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's a birth of the nature of God that's being, that, that we're born of when we're born again. And uh, that's through the birth of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's the new creation, new creature, the new man, Paul called it. And so when Jesus after he died and resurrected and went back to heaven, God accepted his sacrifice, his sinless sacrifice. And he fulfilled the law and the Lord, uh, he let him or had him to send the Holy Ghost back on the day of Pentecost so that people could be born again of a new nature. The difference in us and him is we have the Adamic nature, and we have that new nature once we're born again. And we have to overcome the old nature, the Adamic nature, put on the new man, and put off the old man, Paul said, to, to the Ephesians. And uh, so when Jesus came in the early church, he came in the spirit, and, and he was... He came in that church and it was a 45 year period of time that the Lord uh, in his coming, uh, again, he came as the, as the lightning is from the east to the west. Well, if you read the 19th chapter of Psalms, you'll see that the sun there is used symbolically to show that it comes out of its chamber as a bridegroom running a race. Jesus came. It is like the sun in the east, you know, where I'm pointing right now is to the east where I live. And Jesus, the sun comes up in the east and it sets in the west. Jesus, he came on the day of Pentecost. He came early in the morning. Uh, he came uh, and, and he rose up finally in a sevenfold light. Finally, God came in a light that would judge everything. Um, who is it? Is it Peter or that says that said that he is um, in him is neither no shadow, neither. Uh, it, it, um, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get that verse in my mind. Um, uh, is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So Jesus, you know, in other words, when the when the light, when the when the Son of God really gets close to you and overshadows your life, there uh, uh, until he does, you know, when Jesus begins to come in your life, there's a shadow behind you. You know, you're standing in way of the light and you're in the way that shadows things behind you. There's things by, in the past of your life that are, that the light is not shining on. God will have to do that for you and I. But but when in him there's no variableness or shadow of turning, when the sun gets right up over you, when God gets close enough to you that he's, he's his light, his understanding, the word of God is is illuminating 
in your life all around you, there is no shadow. There's no hidden thing. God undercovers everything in your life and, and he helps you to get rid of everything that would shadow the judgment or the light of God. And so that's how Jesus came back there to that world. He came over a period of time and he harvested that world. Well, he's going to come exactly the same way down here. He's not going to come like that, just snatch away his, his people. That's not how he's coming. He's coming first in a restored church. He's coming, you know, he's been coming in a restor restorative mode, but until the church is restored, he won't fully, um, he wouldn't have fully arrived in the spirit uh, until there's a sevenfold light that we have a full restoration of the church. And then we'll go through a period of time. Uh, I think a 30-year period of time will take us up to the last prophetical hour, which is a, uh, that prophetical hour is a 15-year hour, 15-year uh, period of time in prophecy. And in that 15 years, that's when God will finish making up his bride. Um, and so, but there's so many things that has to take place. So I'm just, I just wanted to mention the coming of the Lord, that it is a process. It's a time, there's a timetable in it that uh, the Lord's coming in. And I think that we are, myself, um, my position right now, I'm not a stickler about time. I'm not, I'm a little bit careful about projecting uh, time. However, I do have uh, a time, uh, the prophetical time, a position on it. I'll say that I do have a position on it that I've looked at it. And I, I think that uh, right now, and I'm not trying to hold you know, right to a year or time frame, but everyone ought to know that we're somewhere in the end of the Gentile world. And I do think in 2033, and I don't come up with that just by adding 2,000 years to the day of Pentecost, I, um, but it is a factor, but I think 2033 will, will finish the 30-year period that the uh, angel of the river Euphrates was loosed for a month. That's a 30 year period prophetically. And then the hour, the last prophetical hour will start. And that's what I'm looking at in position right now, as far as, um, the prophetical hour beginning in, in a, in 2033, if that holds true, we're fixing to enter into 2021 and we're only talking about another 12 years before the last prophetical hour. So you would have to think that the things that is taking place in this world today is, is getting things aligned. God's getting things aligned the way he wants them to be that will fulfill his purpose. And, uh, we know God's going to judge this world. He's going to judge the ungodly world. First, Paul Peter said, judgment first must begin at the house of God. So we have to be willing to go through judgment. Now, let me say something about judgment. Uh, God's judgment is not a it's not a bad judgment. We look at judgment like you know, if you had to go through a court of law and stand before a judge and hear what the verdict's going to be, well, that's not how God judges. Uh, it may ultimately wind up that way, but God's judgment first starts out when you come into the kingdom of heaven. His first judgment is informative and instructive. I'll use both those terms. God, um, we first got to have information. We've got to be informed of God's word. We've got to learn something about his, his purpose. And it takes knowledge to get there. You got to get knowledge and that's information. And uh, so 
so the Lord is helping us first. When we first come into the kingdom of heaven, the Lord will help us come in uh, through the gate of faith. We have to come in and once, once we hear the anointed word of God, by the way, you can't have faith without the anointed word of God touching your life and God will touch you with an anointing that will cause you to have faith. And that faith will cause you to uh, know that God has talked to you. Every individual has to have a measure of faith from that comes from God. Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except my father draws him. And so uh, God is, uh, he, if he sees something in your life, that he can save, he's going to draw you to him and he's going to cause you to have faith. And of course, we got to add to that faith. We got to add virtue. We got to add knowledge, temperance, patience, godly to kindness, brotherly love, and finally, charity, the love of God. But uh, so uh, that's God's judgment starts out just informative and instructive. But then, uh, it becomes investigative or investig uh, God investigates your life. God's judgment, the word of God. If you come to church and you sit in church enough, uh, you'll, you'll find God finally will begin to investigate you. He'll begin, your case will come up. The preacher may, the pastor may not know what he's talking about or whatever minister's talking. He may not know who he's talking to, but God will bring up your case. And God will bring up something in your life that he's investigated that he wants fixed in your life. He wants it corrected. And God, many times, he investigates our lives and he causes us to be, uh, you know, he, God gives us a chance just in correction. A lot of times you can be corrected with uh, just, in, just words. God can just correct you. Get showing you what he wants out of you. You know, you may go for a time rejoicing in the things of God, and then all of a sudden the Lord says, I want you to come up a little higher. Here's something in your life I want you to improve. I want you to go to work on certain areas of your life. And that's God's investigative judgment. And then he has corrective judgment. Sometimes God has to, he has to correct us. He has to take us through things. Sometimes God has to take us through the school of hard knocks in his judgment to get us to learn. You know, sometimes we don't. I was telling the church the other day, sometimes God's dealing with us and we're not, we don't recognize he's dealing with us. I was telling about Brother Lineker. One time Brother Lineker and I was on our way to Haiti in the airplane and he had, his left hand was, the, uh, the skin was peeling off of his left hand. And it had been going through that for months. And he tried putting all kinds of lotions on it, doing everything he could do to get that to heal. And in that plane, I seen he was looking at that hand. He was rubbing it. And he looked over at me and he saw I was looking at him. He said, Brother Smith, you see that hand right there? I said, yes, sir. He said, look at it. I cannot get that to heal. He said, you know why? I said, why? He said, because I still have not learned how to treat my left hand, my left-handed brothers. Men that, you know, in other words, men that are not in uh, uh, sync with him. And, you know, in other words, uh, they, they had differences. Men in the ministry that had differences. He said, God's letting me see that I need to work on my left-handed ministry and learn how to treat them right and have the proper relationship with them. He said, God, he said, I wish you'd pray for me that God would help me to get this right. He said, I know God's dealing with me. Well, see, it takes a man that's sensitive to God to know something like that. Uh, the Bible says in the day of adversity, consider. You know, we ought to realize that God is is 
working in our life, that they're everything that's in our life, God has something to do with it, or he'd like to have something to do with it. Many times we're not sensitive enough to God to even consider things that we're going through. We just think, well, it's just life. Well, listen, it's true that uh, we are subject to chance. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes says, it, it declares that chance happens to all men, even God's children. You can, you can, you know, and God allows that. And then he watches us to see how we respond to chance, things that we go through, how we respond to it, whether or not we react in the flesh or whether or not we are, are responding in the spirit. Uh, so, and that's part of God's judgment. And then, of course, God chastises. There is such thing as sore judgment. You don't want to come under the sore judgment of God. But, um, see, eternal judgment eventually comes, but God doesn't start off at judging anyone eternally. In fact, I that's something I'm studying, but I have serious doubts whether or not any of us have, have, have um experience eternal judgment yet i think it'll take a restored church to bring about eternal judgment upon the saints of god god's just that way god doesn't he does he's not going to judge you for something you don't know and you don't understand uh, but but you know judgment's coming even if it takes a resurrection to enter that judgment it'll take a resurrection to enter judgment if we don't finish our judgment uh, here in this life and in the coming of the Lord. What did John say in 1 John 3? He said, Beloved, he said, What manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us that he uh, that we are called the sons of God? That was amazing to John. What, what, what kind of God has that kind of love that he calls us his sons when we're not doing everything that he's asking us to do, or we haven't even entered into understanding everything he's asking us to do. Excuse me. <coughs> Had a little <clears throat> something in my throat. Anyway, um, but then he goes on and says, uh, when he appears, we shall be like him. I don't think that's talking about when Jesus just shows up. See, Jesus could come today. Let's just say that everyone listening to this broadcast right here, let's say all of us was in a room or in a little church house together and Jesus appeared. When he appears, we shall be like him. That won't make you like him. Jesus appeared to several people back there under the early church. That didn't make them like him. What that scriptures are talking about when he appears in your life, when he, when you begin to become like him, you, when you, your character changes, God's beginning to finish his work in you and he's appeared in you. Like when Jesus said to his disciples, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. When you like to say, when you've seen me, you've seen Jesus. He's appeared in me. I'm like him. God, I want to get to that place. That's that's a desire of mine, and I know it is of yours too. Um, so uh, uh, that has to do with the coming of the Lord. I, I just wanted to cover these scriptures, though. I'll go back now concerning uh, the beast and the image, the mark of the mark of the beast and his image. Uh, if you'll go with me to the 13th chapter of the book of Revelations, of course, he starts off in the in the book of Revelations, and I'm not going to go into this in depth, but it, he starts off in the first chapter, said, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the number of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of, bear, of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Okay, 
right there, this is talking about when the papacy came into power in AD 325. He stood on the sand of the sea, looking out, the sea's the world. He, he saw, this is just prophetical um, allegory, a picture that he was seeing, a vision uh, of, he's looking out into the world. And he sees a beast rise up out of the sea or the world. And that sea, had, that, that beast had seven heads and 10 horns. And we know those seven heads of the beast is talking about world powers. And that started off with Egypt was the first world power. Egypt, then Assyria. Then uh, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia then Greece, and then Rome, and pagan Rome. Those, uh, uh, the, the, this, this beast had seven heads and 10 horns. Um, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna de delve into those heads right now. I'm just gonna say that this is where in this scripture, it's dealing with Rome. This is when Constantine gave the Pope his power. It, it shows that uh, it was likened to a leopard. If you go back to the seventh chapter of Daniel, you'll see that Daniel saw four beasts. He saw the first one was a lion. These are, these, these are go backwards. I'll explain to you why. But Daniel saw a lion, and then he saw a bear, and then he saw a leopard, and then he saw a terrible beast. He, he, he didn't know what else to call it. Just call it a terrible beast. And then he saw a two-horned beast, and that was the papacy. All right, this here where, where it says here that he uh, the beast he saw was likened to a leopard. See, Rome had right before it was... Greece, which was the leopard in Daniel 7. And then, then it said it had feet of a bear. Its foundation of, of government was like, like the media Persian. Uh, media Persian had two parts to it. It had the Medes, the Medes and Persians that came together in world power and uh, Rome did that. Rome had pagan power and then papal power, uh, the papacy. And and his mouth spoke as a lion. That's Babylon. You know, it had a great voice, like the voice that Nebuchadnezzar had in Babylon. And uh, and the dragon, that is, that's pagan Rome, gave him the papacy, his power and his seat and great authority. And uh, if you go on down just a little bit, it shows that um, power was given to him, verse five, to continue 42 months. That's 1260 days or prophetically 1260 years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Now in, in AD, he came into existence or was given power in AD 325, but it wasn't until 538 that he actually gained rule over the whole world, the known world back there. And that 1260 years and 538 takes you to 1798, which is when the Napoleon, the French general, put the papacy put the Pope in prison and ended his rule over the whole whole world. Anyway, he's giving, he's beginning to give this, but then when you get down in the 11th verse, John said, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Of course, my position on this is this is the United States of America, the two-horned beast. But it doesn't matter what your position on it is. Uh, one of the reasons I I have that position is because if you will look, um, this is another beast coming up out of the earth. Notice in the first verse, John saw this seven horn, this seven headed beast come up out of the sea. Here is another beast coming up out of the earth. 
had two horns like a lamb. To me, that's talking about the uh, religious and civil power of the United States. Both our forefathers started out in the beginning fearing God. We was a godly nation, God-fearing uh, government, our governor officials, our presidents, our designers uh, that made up the Declaration of Independence. They all feared God. In God we trust is what they put on our on our dollar. And one nation under God was in our allegiance to the flag of America. And this nation was lamb-like in the beginning, both civilly and religiously. But uh, then it says, uh, let's see, uh, Okay, he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Finally, America speaking as a dragon. Actually, America has been the superpower of the world for a long time and, and has operated somewhat as a dragon. I don't think it will uh, speak uh, effectively as a dragon, as other dragon powers, until... Uh, it finally makes an image to the beast and finally gets uh, the help uh, or feels like it's going to get help from the papacy. Anyway, let's, let's, let's look at that again here. Um, verse 12 says he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. So this beast that was before him that we just read about in the 13th chapter was which when the papacy came into power and was in power 1260 years and that power ended in 1798. And we haven't had a dragon power in the world that's operated like these other world powers until this finally, uh, when that power ended, God gave a space for the restoration of the church, the Protestant movement, the Pentecostal movement, and finally the movement of the body of Christ. The body of Christ was the very heart of what God did in the Pentecostal movement. I think that we are, as the body of Christ, are beyond the Pentecostal movement. I think we're in a 30-year period that takes us out of Pentecost of 100 years and puts us into uh, a different category. And I think God is requiring a garment change period right now. I think we just like the 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 priest in the outer in the uh, tabernacle, before he could go into the holy place and offer uh, the blood of the sacrifice, he had to remove his woolen garment, which is a type of the flesh, and put on a white linen garment before he went into the holy place. And so, and that's where I think we are. I think we've been in the laver, which is the Pentecostal era, the hundred year period of the, uh, the day that uh, the angel in river, uh, the river Euphrates was loosed in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations. Uh, but now I think we're in the 30 year period one, where the angel that was loose for a month and then the restored church will be in the, the hour, the 15 year or last prophetical hour period. Uh, uh, but anyway, so he exercised the, verse 12. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them. Now, let me let me go back to earth here for a second. This beast rose up out of the earth. Now, notice that's different than coming up out of the sea. And the United States of America did not come out of the world. It did not develop like the rest of the heads of the beast that developed right out of the world, ungodly kingdoms. This nation was lamb-like. This nation came up in the earth and I believe that word earth right there would be the same as in the seventh chapter uh, that uh, 
represents religion. It's not the world or the sea, but it's the earth. It's higher than the sea. It represents religion and the rest restorative period of Protestantism that brought us to America and then Pentecostal, the Pentecostal era. And so I think that's that's dealing with religion. And I think this nation has been the nation of Christendom in, for the most part in God's restoring the church and bringing us to America to to bring about the restored church of the body of Jesus Christ where he can finish and harvest this world in this last 30 and 15 year period. Uh, let me go on here. Uh, let me see here. Okay, I had power to, okay. Uh, Okay, he exercised all the first power of the first beast and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein, I'm in verse 12, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying, to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Uh, and, power, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as though as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Well, uh, here, here's what's going to happen. Uh, in the end of this world, and I think it is the United States, it's certainly a civil and religious or ecclesiastical power, powers that are going to work together as a dragon and they're going to set up and mark the image of the beast. And, and that piece, that beast that had a wound, what, which is the papacy, is going to be healed. And that's the eighth head that's of the seven. And so it will come into power. And here's what will happen. All of, all of religion will come back together. And there is a civil power or a nation. That's why I, that's why my position is that it's the United States. If the United States will give have enough power to bring the papacy back into power with them to rule the world and try to bring peace to this world, that will be their intent. But they're not God fearing. They're not being led of God. This is a work of man, and. And, and what will happen is all of the Christian and even some non-Christian religious groups will come together uh, under that system. And they'll call it the healing of the body. So you notice everybody now today is, is, is using the term the body of Christ. Well, everyone using the term body of Christ is not the body of Christ. They've just picked up that term. This message of the body of Christ has got out over a period of many years. And so uh, anyway, uh, I know I'm going to run out of time here before I even get to these scriptures, but I wanted to give them to you right quick. But I wanted to give some understanding as we went and and show that, uh, that there, this the image of the beast said he causeth, verse 16, causeth all, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehands. That right hand is the ministry. There's several, there's many ministers that will take this mark in their hand. They'll join up with that system. Uh, many will be deceived. Many of them will be pressured into it. Uh, you know, but 
uh, are in their foreheads. That is in your thinking. You know, that people will take the mindset of the beast system, the image of the beast that will be set up. The image just means just, it's, it's as near as being just like that that was before it. We're building something that was just like it with civil power and religious power. In fact, if I'm right, and this is the United States or whatever civil power it is, but I can't see any other power that, that would have the power to do it outside the United States. I realize we're not there yet. There could be changes, but I don't see that happening. I think we're too close to it, uh, especially what's going on right now. The liberals in this nation are, you know, somebody said recently, they said that, that the that the, the liberals, the Democratic Party, are to realize that they can't change 50% of the people in this country. And they are to realize there's something wrong with the Democratic Party because they can't change it. I don't think that that's the way they look at it at all. I think they look at it as we have changed 50% and we're going to change the other 50%. We are going to move this country towards liberalism. You remember what our past president said when he was in office? I'm not talking about Brother Tr uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about pa President Trump, but I'm talking about President Obama. Here's what he said. He said, "Before I leave this office, every homosexual." Well, I will make sure before I leave this office that they'll have every right that everyone else in this country has. And he he pushed that as far as he could push it. And it, it became as true as it's ever been before. Uh, and that's what, Democrat, that's what a democratic government is. Democratic government is freedom of speech. It's freedom of religion. It's freedom, you know, uh, I don't think our forefathers ever thought there would be the loopholes in democracy that there is, but uh, there had to be that kind of loopholes in democracy for this country to have the freedom that it's, that it's had. Freedom of religion or the true church could never have been uh, developed or restored. And so God, it's a, it's a temporary government. It's certainly not God's mode of government. God's mode is theocracy, not democracy. But it, God saw the need for democracy to, for his plan to be fulfilled. Uh, anyway, so and I'll say this about democracy. I think because during Protestantism, uh, God put it in the minds of, of the church and the people to have a democracy within the church where they had uh, they had uh, boards, they had they, they even hired and fired preachers. That's not God's order, but God gave that for the protection of the people because of the beast system that they came out from underneath, and it God it called men to have to have to be careful about how they treated the people of God. Uh, because the people of God had some power through their democratic rule or the democratic government that was set up in the churches. It's not God's order. It's certainly not New Testament order, but I think God allowed it. Uh, and now God is through a restored church trying to take us back to God's order and God's government. It's certainly not where the people rule anymore. However, God is requiring that his ministry, remember how there's a good type where Joseph, the, Joseph was told by the angel, don't you touch Mary until this child comes forth. That, that is a type for the ministry of the body of Christ that this seed of this new man, this Holy Ghost nature, this character of God that we're born of, his nature, that we are not to touch this woman, the church, with our seed until 
God brings forth this Christ-like man-child. And so uh, God's going to have to have a ministry that can be trusted. God's going to have to have a ministry that won't build their own kingdom and that can back up to one another like the oxen underneath the laver put their hinder parts together. Uh, it's going to take fellowship. It's going to take confidence, trust, and it's going to take uh, 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 unity for God to finally produce the love of God. And that's all going to have to be an operation of God. And we as the men of God have to pray for that and the people of God. Look, it's just not all on the ministry. The ministry is the leading part that is to project to the people. But the people are to become just like us, just like we're to become like Christ. You're to, the people are to become like Christ. Uh, that's what the Lord's leading us to. He's leading us by example and by gifts, but we're all to become like him. And so... I'm talking about in righteousness, in righteous character. We'll all be individuals. We'll all still have our, you, know, you might say, our fingerprint, our iris, our individuality that God wants us to have. But it'll be in the righteousness of this new nature of Christ. So he's going to, uh, everyone will be called to, call to receive the mark the mindset, the doctrine, the ideology of the beast system in their mind, it'll deceive millions of people. Millions of people will be deceived by that. And that no man might buy or sell. That's talking about buying or selling the gospel. You be prohibited to preach the, the word of God outside of belonging to that system, save he that had the mark and or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Remember, the number of his name is 666, and that is man's number six. And the body, the soul, and the spirit, the body or makeup of people of that system is of man. It's come together in man's fellowship, man's unity, not God's. Uh, uh, the soul or mind, that's the mindset. That's the doctrinal areas and teachings beliefs of that system and the spirit of it. The spirit of it, of course, a spirit is something that's produced through the mind. When a mind acts on a thought, it produces a spirit and the spirit of the beast will, uh, the whole thing, body, soul, and spirit will be the number of a man. And so that that's going to take place. So I just read to you the 13th, 14th, and 15th verses above to show this mark, the image of the beast to be set up and the mark of, be, of the beast will be set up. Now, in the 14th chapter, I'll read that to you and it will take us but a few minutes here to finish, finish up with this. But in the 14th chapter of Revelations, verse 11, it says, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever that they should... I have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image who and whosoever receiveth the the mark of his name. Um, see, and the reason I'm bringing these scriptures up is because nowhere else in the Bible, New Testament, does it have anything to do with the mark of the beast. And saints, <laughs> this thing's not over. First, there's going to have to be a mark of the beast set up. And then it's going to be a, a, a period of time of everyone taking that mark outside of those in the body of Christ that reject it. We're not going to take that mark. We're not going to be marked by that system or become, we're not going to accept the number of the name. We're going to, not going to take their mark in our foreheads, their ideology, and those that are in the ministry that reject it will not become a part of it. But there will be. I'll promise you there'll be people out of this body become a part of it. I hate to say that, but I, I know it's true. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever and have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image. Uh, let me back up here just a minute. 
I want to back up because there's in this 14th chapter, it's talking about in the very first, in the, if let's, let's back up just a little bit. It'll take me just a minute to cover this. Uh, in the sixth verse, it says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Listen, saints, that's a restored ministry down here in the end of this Gentile world. Uh, we used to teach that this was a the Jews, a Jewish ministry. That 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 won't fit the context of this chapter. This is a restored ministry. This is still part of the seventh trumpet that that blows in the eleventh chapter, and it continues to blow. You can't show me where the seventh trumpet quits blowing. None of these trumpets quit blowing until uh, the next trumpet blows. And I know there's a teaching of the trumpet, seven trumpets being in, down through the thousand years or during the vials being poured out. That won't fit either. Uh, i would be more than happy to discuss that with anyone. Uh, but uh, it, we need to listen to one another on these things and we need to consider someone can help me see something better and make more sense out of it than I can, then I certainly will change. I've changed on several things. But let's go on having the everlasting gospel fly. We're no longer on the earthly, devilish, sensual, terra firma, but we've up into a second heaven condition, flying with the everlasting gospel. That's what we're all striving for. When it's everlasting, it don't have to change. There's things we're going to... We're not together, <coughs> excuse me. We're not together on many things and therefore we are going to have to change that we don't have what's everlasting yet in every area uh, to preach to them that dwell on the earth. Now, verse seven says, saying to them with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory. All right, for the hour, that's that 15 hour, 15 year prophetical hour, of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of, and waters. Heaven and earth, it's the body of Christ. Earth, I would say, is the United States and the sea is the, the uh, world and fountains of waters, which is uh, the true people of God, wherever they are. And there followed another angel, Babylon, is fallen, saying Babylon's fallen is fallen. See there, Babylon is is going to be in a fallen condition. It's not going to be a Jewish ministry that judges Babylon. It's going to be a restored ministry down here. The Jews will be grafted back in, but this ministry down here, before it passes off the scene and their mantle touches uh, a Jewish ministry for the thousand work of the thousand years is going to take place first. And the angel followed them. Okay, a third angel followed them. So Babylon's going to be fear God and give him glory. We we don't fear God enough. I won't go into it, but we we've got something to learn about that. Then Babylon is fallen. That's going to happen. Babylon's going to be judged, but first God will get all his people out of Babylon that can be got out of Babylon. Then a third angel follows, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image. That's the part I wanted to bring to your attention. See, in God harvesting this world, in the end of this world, in this 15 years, prophetical time frame, if any man worship the beast and his image. See, there's people worshiping the beast right now but his image hadn't been set up yet. And there's going to be a ministry that's going to warn against taking the mark of the beast in his image uh, in his forehead or in his hand, the same will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So I was going on down reading and showing in the 14th chapter in the ninth and 11th verse that uh they, they won't rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark on his name. If you got questions on uh, smoke sending up forever and ever, send me a question on it to that text number. I'll explain it to you. I just don't have time tonight. I'm running out of time. 
anyway, uh, okay, then next is in the 15th chapter. Let's go down to the 15th chapter of the book of Revelations. The first verse said, I saw an angel, I saw an angel, another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass. Well, there's not too much question in my mind about who that is, that, that, but they're getting, they got victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. That hasn't been set up yet. This is this will have to be set up before this can come to pass in the 15th chapter. Then in the 16th chapter, uh, it starts off saying, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went out and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast upon and upon them which worship worshiped his image. And so there, here it is again, the mark of the beast is brought up in these scriptures. This beast hadn't even been, the image of the beast hadn't even been set up yet. And so, uh, that worshiped his image, see, the very last part of the scripture too, uh, too. So I just wanted to bring out, now there's a couple more scriptures I'll give you uh, in the 19th chapter, in the 20th verse, and the beast was taken and with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. We know that lake of fire is second death. It's eternal judgment. So uh, it's just bring, I'm just giving you scriptures that's never been used again before in the New Testament concerning the, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast and that worship the image. Then in, in Revelations 20, we all know this verse, but I don't know how many picks it up. Picks it up. This is where uh, the bride is mentioned in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelations. It said, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's the bride of Christ. But that's the people down here that was, uh, uh, it includes the people that was uh, made up the bride in the early church that got the victory over that beast system back there. But here is worshiped his image. So, this image has got to be set up first and God's got to help us to get to a place, to go through. We're going to have to go through a process. So Jesus, I never heard this before till I came to this body some 40 plus years ago when I heard a man preach and say, Jesus is not coming tonight. He's not, matter of fact, he's not coming this week. He said, as a matter of fact, he's not coming this month. He said, as a matter of fact, he's not coming this year. I had never heard a preacher talk like that ever before. <laughs> but I'm a preacher today that will echo his words and tell you Jesus is not coming tonight, not for his church. He could come get you. And he told his disciples, your time's always, but my time's not yet come. Because God has a purpose and he has a time and a season that he works in and how his order works. And so... Uh, the Lord, he's not fixing to come. He's The work's not finished. We've got too many prophetical scriptures that have to take place yet. Uh, I 
haven't even said anything about the 10 kings that's going to come into power, and they're going to come into power well after. It will be in the last 15 years, uh, prophetical years, but it won't be when the image of the beast is set up. That's the beginning. That'll be the beginning. And uh, there's a lot of work that's got to take place. We are going to have to get busy, saints. And I've been listening to many of the saints in the body of Jesus Christ on Facebook. And it literally shocks me as how many saints have lost the foundation teachings in this body. I can tell by the way they talk that they don't have these foundation teachings that helps them to know and understand what this body taught and what was planted and established in the body years before us. And this ministry is going to have to reestablish some of that foundation teaching in this body. Plus, we got a lot of new people coming. I'd just like to say this to younger ministers in the body of Christ. Begin to study. Begin to work. Get your mind girded up to receive the foundation keys of understanding the truths of the word of God because we have a whole host of God's children that are be, going to be coming out of Babylon when God harvests in the, them in the end of this world, Gentile world. They are going to have to be settled. They are going to have to be strengthened. They're going to have to be established before they can ever reach perfection. That's what Peter said. He said, thanks be unto the Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, how did he say it? Who has perfected uh, after we've suffered for a while. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Well, I use that just going backwards, at first you've got to get settled when you get here. There's got to be enough information, anointed information, that causes you to be settled in your mind that this is God's people, it's his body, he's restoring his church, and then you're going to have to have enough foundation teachings that will strengthen you unto the place that you finally become established in the things of God's eternal purpose that will take you on to perfection in its final uh, work. Anyway, God bless your hearts. Pray for our nation. Pray for our churches in the body of Jesus Christ. Pray for those that you know among us that has this virus. Let's pray. Let's ask God to, to begin to spare. Spare everyone that can be spared, oh God. Help your people, Jesus. God, touch your people tonight and touch this body. Touch your ministry, your precious saints. Oh, God, we pray. Oh, Lamb of God, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're serving a great God, saints, and he, he loves his children. And uh, he's working a work right now. Be still, be mindful, watch and pray. Watch, get, get, get sensitive to God. Ask God to help you, help your senses spiritually to be sensitive enough to know what God is saying. God bless your hearts. I'll see you, those of you, uh, the saints of God uh, in uh, Little Rock. I'll see you Sunday morning. Bible study at uh, breakfast at 9.30, Bible study at 10 church at 1130. God bless your hearts. 